the environment is being used for a power struggle. The environment is being used for centralized government. The environment is being used to make a one world government. A few Americans really understand how much of our land has been taken over. They are looking after somebody else's welfare, not the welfare and the rights of the American people. I think that there is a, that there's a real question here about the sovereignty of the United States. It permits, I should say, really, that U.S. troops may be deployed under U.N. command. Well, what I now know is that just because you join the U.S. Army doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be fighting for the U.S. And that means eternal resistance to this idea that we are somehow going to disappear in some new world order. Eagle Forum presents a special report, Global Governance, the Quiet War Against American Independence. When Bill Clinton delivered his acceptance speech at the 1992 Democratic National Convention, the only person he mentioned, other than his mother and grandfather, was his history professor at Georgetown University Foreign Service School. As a teenager, I heard John Kennedy's summons to citizenship. And then, as a student at Georgetown, I heard that call clarified by a professor named Carol Quigley. Professor Quigley's 1,300-page book, entitled Tragedy and Hope, described the small elite which he said actually runs the United States. Quigley labeled it the network and said it consists of men who are cosmopolitan and international, close to governments, equally devoted to secrecy and the secret use of financial influence in political life. Quigley wrote that this network always prefers big government, big federal spending, large foreign giveaways, and the stability of a planned society rather than the uncertainties of the free market. Professor Quigley taught his student from Hope, Arkansas, how to tap into the power centers of the network. When Bill Clinton became president, he surrounded himself with people who shared that vision. When Bill Clinton took office in 1993, he appointed his Rhodes Scholar roommate as his personal foreign policy advisor. Strobe Talbot had spent 22 years as a writer for Time magazine, where his writings revealed his eagerness to get rid of patriotism, American sovereignty, and independence. In the July 20th, 1992 time, Talbot wrote an article entitled, The Birth of the Global Nation. He enthusiastically predicted that in the next century, Nationhood as we know it will be obsolete. All states will recognize a single global authority. In fact, wrote Talbot, national sovereignty wasn't such a great idea after all. Talbot bragged about how our national sovereignty and independence have already been diminished by the International Monetary Fund and the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or GATT agreements. He boasted that the internal affairs of a nation are no longer off limits to world government. For his article, Talbot received an award from the World Federalist Association, a group committed to world government, and a congratulatory letter from Bill Clinton. Later, President Clinton appointed Strobe Talbot to the number two post in the U.S. State Department. Strobe Talbot and those who dream of putting the United States under a single global authority know that Americans will never vote for world government. So instead, they talk about global governance, a global village, a global neighborhood, a global economy, a global commons. That means the sea, the air, and outer space. They talk about reforming the United Nations and expanding NATO. The solution to the problems they raise is always more international agencies wielding more and more control over American land, private property, natural resources, economy, trade, military forces, and even our personal relationships. The global governance bureaucrats in the Clinton administration have a close working relationship with the bureaucrats in international organizations. Together they use two principal techniques to increase the power of global organizations, treaties and international conferences. November 20th, 1989. With much fanfare and plenty of pictures of children, National news media announced that the United Nations adopted the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The United Nations agreed that all countries should make sure 
that the rights of children everywhere are protected. A treaty to protect children? Not according to constitutional attorney Michael Farris. If the UN Convention is ratified, parents can't spank their children, they can't take them to church uh, without a, a supervisor uh, from the UN looking over their shoulder, making sure that they like what's going on. They can't uh, choose alternative forms of education, either within the public schools or home schools or private schools. They uh, cannot uh, make decisions that keep their children away from pornography or other kinds of illicit material because the child has freedom of access to information. They uh, uh, lose control uh, of any decision-making that would go against the politically correct thinking of the day. This treaty proclaims broad rights of children which presumably can be asserted against their parents. Article 12 would give the child the right to express his own views freely in all matters. Article 13 gives the child the right to receive information through the media of the child's choice. And Article 31 gives children a right to rest and leisure. The Convention on the Rights of Children goes on to prescribe that the education of the child shall include support of the United Nations, global education, multiculturalism, feminism, and environmentalism. And who will decide whether parents are obeying the UN Treaty? A United Nations committee created by Article 43. We should not have people outside this country mandating how we'll educate our children, what we'll do for our kids, when we'll do it, or what they'll read, or what they'll be exposed to, and what parental control Will be. I don't really believe that our government should interfere substantially with child rearing. It would be wrong for states to tell parents what, uh, what they could or what they should do with their children or for the federal government. But when you take that beyond the state and the federal government to an international organization that would seek to tell you, for instance, that you couldn't take your child out of certain sex education classes in our schools, for example. I think a family ought to have a right to understand what values it supports in that arena and to protect the uh, child in relation to those values. But the United Nations does not agree. In 1995, at the UN compound in Geneva, Switzerland, UN officials chastised Great Britain for allowing parents the freedom to choose spanking as a means of discipline and for allowing parents to withdraw their children from sex education classes in public schools. We have to understand that a treaty in the United States is the highest law of the land, co-equal with the Constitution, co-equal with federal laws passed in accordance with the Constitution. I'm not so much worried about the world court enforcing it against American citizens as I am the United States District Court for the District of Maryland or New Hampshire or, or Rhode Island infer, enforcing this decision based upon uh, uh, the tribunal's decisions from Geneva as to what the treaty means. The Children's uh, Defense Fund, for example, could bring a, a lawsuit against a, a Christian school or a homeschooling uh, family or a group of families and say that your homeschooling, your Christian school uh, uh, approach violates the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and it would be enforceable in American courts. Presidents Ronald Reagan and George Bush refused to sign this treaty, but President Clinton supports it and had Madeleine Albright sign it and now they are pushing for its ratification in the U.S. Senate. That is not the only United Nations treaty supported by the Clinton administration that is designed to control human behavior. President Jimmy Carter signed the United Nations Convention on Discrimination Against Women in 1980. Presidents Reagan and Bush refused to support it. But now Bill Clinton is pushing for ratification. The women who are behind this treaty are women who are not interested as any ordinary American would be in marriage, love, children, uh, having a family, quite the opposite. They tend to be women who want marriage to go away, who promote homosexual rights, who promote abortion on demand, all of these things that are totally contrary to the wishes of the vast majority of American women and men. Article 1 on the UN Treaty on Women would abolish discrimination against women in the political, economic, social, cultural, civil, or any other field. This treaty covers marriage, family, church practices, other religious customs and beliefs, and every other area where society might otherwise choose to respect those differences. In case of any doubt, Article 2 states that the treaty would even extend to what it calls customs and practices. 
Article 3 would require us to pass new federal laws in social, economic, and cultural fields. Article 16 levels a broadside attack on states' rights and would obligate the federal government to take over all family law, including marriage, divorce, child custody, and property. And who would decide if you and your family are abiding by this UN treaty? A United Nations committee set up by Article 17. This treaty, like other feminist exercises, is full of deception. And it's a good illustration of how people who have a political agenda to gain power for themselves use words to persuade others to join them uh, through deception. A good example is the word family. When you or I use the word family, we mean mom, dad, and the kids. We mean extended family, grandma, grandpa. When they mean family, they mean two guys who met each other in a bar on Saturday night and have decided to live together. They mean any collection of people who have a either uh, permanent or temporary interest in one another. That is just not what the rest of us mean by family, yet feminists will constantly invoke the word family with their own meaning in mind, hoping that we'll be fooled. For example, Article 5 would require us to modify the social and cultural patterns of conduct of men and women and to assure that we are following UN dictates about family education. And Article 10 would even require the revision of all textbooks and teaching methods to adhere to UN definitions about family and feminism. The people representing the family legitimately and so forth, they were not permitted even to participate. And all of these wild-eyed people who want the government to control families and everybody else, they were in charge. Jesse Helms is chairman of the U.S. Senate subcommittee that oversees treaties. He opposes these U.N. treaties. Well, of course, these treaties that uh, emanate from the uh, United Nations, they are looking after somebody else's welfare, not the welfare and the rights of the American people. And that's the reason I look askance at every one of them. Meanwhile, the Clinton administration is pushing hard for another series of treaties that would give international organizations control over our national economy. The Chemical Weapons Treaty purports to ban chemical weapons, but many critics believe this will seriously damage U.S. national security. There are parts of the treaty that seem to suggest that you cannot put intelligent limitations on the export of technology, that Everyone who signs the treaty must trade freely in all of the technologies of chemical warfare. Well, of course, every other country in the world would love it if they could have immediate required access to American technology in this area. We probably have the most sophisticated such technology in the world. I don't want to export that, te that technology. I don't want there to be a treaty out there that even hints or suggests that we have to. That's something over which we must exercise control and we must make the judgments. We meaning leaders whom we can hold responsible. But the UN Chemical Weapons Treaty provides no such accountability. Though it would give both allies and enemies our most sophisticated technology, many dangerous countries such as Libya, Syria, Iraq and North Korea have not signed the treaty. Other countries with significant chemical weapons arsenals, such as Iran and Russia, have indicated that they will not comply with the treaty. In spite of the potential damage to U.S. national security and the unverifiable and unenforceable nature of the treaty, the Clinton administration succeeded in getting the U.S. Senate to ratify the Chemical Weapons Treaty in 1997. The Chemical Weapons Treaty, of course, doesn't do one thing to protect the American people against chemical warfare. Yet it is, has caused many people to have a false sense of security. It's interesting. We have a, a new Chemical Weapons Ban Treaty for which the people that are most likely to threaten us are not a party to. Uh, it's not much of a treaty. What, what did we accomplish with it? We accomplished nothing other than limiting ourselves to have a weak negotiating position uh, with those very adversaries that we face today. Another dangerous UN treaty that would damage our national economy is the law of the sea. Nearly three-fourths of the world's surface is covered by water. 
American companies harvest minerals from the sea that are important to our industrial and military defense. In the late 70s, the Carter administration developed a treaty that would effectively give the United Nations decision-making authority over the world's vast ocean riches. And we have succeeded in adopting a convention covering practically every aspect of the uses and resources of the sea. But President Ronald Reagan opposed the treaty. Doug Bandell worked on the law of the sea during his administration. It really did two things. The first is it established a principle of essentially socialism. It said that all the unclaimed resources on the seabed would be owned by, as they put it, the common heritage of mankind. What they meant, of course, was by the United Nations. And the ownership would be vested in governments around the world. And he saw that as utterly inconsistent with the principles of free enterprise. His second concern was the way the UN would implement that principle, which was essentially to create another United Nations called the International Seabed Authority. And that seabed authority would have under it you know, its own you know, corporation, the enterprise, to go mine the seabed on behalf of the governments of the world. And this would run like the United Nations. It would have a council and an assembly and committees and a huge bureaucracy. It would be taking money from the West, the industrialized countries, and giving it to third world countries. So it would be part of this whole scheme of what was called the new international economic order, an attempt to take money from the West and hand it out to third world governments. Well, he saw the, this, this kind of a mechanism as being utterly inconsistent with the American interest, and he was quite willing to stand up to the rest of the world and kill the treaty for that reason. The Clinton administration has revived the Law of the Sea Treaty and is pushing for Senate ratification. If passed, this treaty would... ...planted before the meeting even began that the opening day of the conference... ...into a United Nations army. And the American people...